Hello everyone. A very heartly Eid Mubarak to all. I hope you all would have wonderful Eid this week with your loved ones. Eid in lockdown was a bit different this year. And for the first time, we took time to Zoom instead of meeting relatives and friends in person. I would like to assert that even though government is easing up the lockdown, but caution against the public meetings and gatherings are there as the danger of coronavirus remains. The best way to uh, do that is to stick to the simple things we know can uh, stop the spread of coronavirus. You have heard these tips before, but you will keep hearing them because they are currently our best defense against the virus. So continue social distancing, wash your hands frequently for 20 seconds, do don't touch surfaces out in public, wear a mask, where it's hard to social distance, cover cough and sneezes with a tissue and then throw it away. If you don't have tissue handy, cough or sneeze into your long sleeves at the elbow fold. Try not to touch uh, your mouth, nose or eyes. And with that, I would uh, finish my Eid message. Now let's get down to the business. Podcast tonight is about bubble and insertion source and Sir James Avila is joining us today from Malaysia. Thank you very much, Mr. James Avila for joining us today. Sir James Avila is a highly recognized educationist and classroom practitioner. Currently, he is the head of computing at Garden International Schools, Malaysia. And before that, he served as ICT head and teacher at various schools in UK, Thailand, and Malaysia. His honors and awards include Apple Distinguished Educator and Google Certified Innovator besides several publications. I came across with Sir James Abela over uh, Twitter and, and, and then I requested him to uh, have a guest, get, guest spot on our show, which he accepted. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. James uh, can be reached at Twitter with the handle at ESLweb and his contacts and uh, how he can be reached is given in the description below. Beside that, whatever the code that Sir James will be using, the link is already given in uh, the description below. We are honored to have him as a guest and he will be helping learners to understand bubble and insert source. So let's get to Sir James. Hi, um, thank you very much for this guest spot. Um, these are recordings that are only longer than my YouTube channel. So I'm going to give this a go and have a really good go at this a longer format. I hope you enjoy it. And if you want five to ten hints and tips, then please feel free to go over to my YouTube channel and have a look for those bits and pieces. Um, I hope you all enjoyed E this week and you've managed it now. A nice safe way and spend uh, some great fireworks and I think most people have been very sensible in this challenging time. So let's look at bubble source and insertion source. Let's start by asking this page music list. Yeah, right, absolutely. Um, DJs, they're the ones who get paid to sort live. And what I like about a DJ is that they have to use very human criteria to do this, but they do it and an order and what they want to do. Perhaps it's beat matching, perhaps it's genre and all of these things. Now, once upon a time, when I was younger, 
internet will not sort it in any way, shape, or form. And Google came up with a sorting criteria called PageRank. It revolutionized the now you take it absolutely for granted that you can get to a web page in seconds. That was not always true. Now, why is well, firstly, it's important to get some ideas and go through in order. But let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. So why sort? Well, if you've ever gone to a second-hand bookstore and tried to find the book you want, it can sometimes be a challenge because a lot of second-hand bookstores don't take a great deal of pride in sorting anything. In fact, they don't sort it at all. Some of you might see something. And I think all of us can agree that this is not sorted in any way, shape, or form. If you're lucky, you might get genre, or you might get the reference section. But yeah, it's not great. This is what we call an ear search. You literally go through every last little item until you find what you want. Not a great plan. It's not going to make the computer happy. In fact, I once had a friend do an e-commerce site and it was taking them three days to find a book. Three days. And this was a Amazon could do it almost real time, you know? So those are the challenges. You have to search through every single item. It's so important to sort your data. Now, body has got a soft spot for the bubble sort. It is it's a great way to learn what it is that makes a good search engine by starting with first effectively. Let's start by having a look at this code. How many loops are there in here? It's not a trick question. There's two loops. Right. Hopefully you're spotting them. There's one, and it's called my list. How many variables? There's two. Now, depending if you grab some code off the internet, you might find there's only one needed in Python. And that's because Python can very easily do a swap and hide the extra bit of the in the scenes. Okay, so this is the pseudo variable sort. Let's have a look at how this works and, and use a little bit of visualization. So this is the main loop, the one that's uh, doing the individual suite. And what it's doing is swapping data as it goes along. Okay. So you can see that's done one sweep through and it's made a bit of a difference. Let's have a look now at the overall loop in action. Notice how the bubble is working. You can see those bubbles going around. And you can see it's slowly moving its way through, swap, 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 and it's almost finished. As you can see, that is very useful and very handy um, and really helps you to sort your loops. Now it's very quick for a computer to get to the number it was. Okay, so there you go, you've seen some code. Now let's start to look at what I want you to have a go at. Now, I think it's really important to have a look at this. You've got an outer loop and an inner loop. So I've split them into one and two so you can do it. Build the main loop in Python. That's task number one. Then number two, build the overall loop. Check it with a list of numbers and make it a function. That's what I'd like you to do. Now, obviously this is a practical exercise. So what would the exam questions look like? Well, the first question would be write programming code from this pseudocode, which is exactly what you're going to do. And then there's a good chance there's a follow-up question. So an exam style extension question is explain how you can make the bubble sort more efficient. And we'll look at that after you've had a go at this.
Right, let's uh, have a look at this code now. So, exam style question, write programming code for this pseudocode. Now, I've done this as a function, so def bubble sort, a list. A list can be any name, of course. So, I put the a list here, it equals these things here. Um, some of you might choose to put a random function in. In fact, a lot of the time I see random functions when they do this, so they can have nice numbers. And bubble sort calls the procedure and then just print a list. So we have the bubble sort here, uh, we have our first for loop, and then we have the second for loop, printing a list as we go. Now this is very optional, but I find when you're learning these kind of things, it's important to see what's going on at each step. So it's a simple debugging tool. So if a list i is larger than a list i plus one, this is where the swap is happening, and then we're using this temp, and as I said, this will uh, enable you to follow the pseudocode more precisely. And then we do the swap, and that's the lines that's going on. That is a very nice, elegant, simple piece of code. And it also proves why you should never use line count as a good way to suggest if a program's being actually efficient. Yeah, it's simple, quick to program, but terribly inefficient in terms of computer usage time. So, that's the most basic form. Let's have a look at the modification here. Explain how you can make the bubble sort more efficient. Now, you can see the code is longer here, but what it's doing is testing at the end of each of the inner loops whether it had to make any swaps or not. If it didn't have to make any swaps, then it breaks the loop and the job is done. So you can see that will actually reduce it by quite a lot. Now, if you want some proof, again, they weren't asked for this in the exam, but I think it's always important when doing practical things to have a go at. You can use the date time library, and what you can do is see how long it takes for the computer to actually do it. So this extra code here is checking the time and seeing how long it would take. And feel free in your program to try it both ways and see how much more efficient it can be. Um, Obviously, this depends on how badly sorted you are. Worst case scenario for something like this is the reverse order, and we'll see an example of that later. But that's a nice little extra for you to really test it and see how long it, it works. That's gonna be especially useful later when we have a look and start comparing our loops. So, the bubble sort. Is it the butt of jokes everywhere? I think you'll find out why. Um, just in case you don't know, uh, that's Barack Obama. He's used to be president of the United States, and that's Eric Schmidt, who used to run Google. But I think it's a really keen moment when you see the engineers at Google have a go at this. What is the most efficient way to sort a million 32-bit integers? <laughs> well, uh... I'm, I'm, maybe I, I, I'm sorry. Maybe no, 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 no. I, 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 I think that's not a. Not I, I, a I think uh, I think the uh, the bubble sort would be the wrong way to go. <laughs> uh, Come on, who told him this? So, uh, the next most efficient is the insertion sort, and let's compare how these two things actually work. So what we can see here is the insertion sort. At the moment, it looks similar, except what the insertion sort is doing is when it finds something it needs to swap, it's putting it all the way to the correct spot. And the insertion sort is still going while the bubble sort has long since finished. And you can see it going round and round and round. Finally done it, and you can see the difference here. So let's have a look in a little bit more detail at an insertion sort and what it's actually doing. So it starts, obviously the first number, it does nothing. The second number, it says, hang on a minute, let's have a little check. Is four bigger than three? Yeah, it is. And so it swaps it around. Now, it knows everything to the left here is actually properly sorted. So it's now going to continue moving onwards. 
Two bigger than four? Yeah. It is. Two bigger than three? And you get the idea. Moving on to the next one. Now this is where it gets interesting. Is 10 bigger than four? Yes, it is. Is 12 bigger than 10? Yeah, it is. Is one bigger than 12? No, it is not. So it's gonna go around, ask the question for each one and pop it in the right place. As you can see, each time it gets it, it inserts it into the correct place. Now this time, I've been a fairly good sport and I've given you a bit of a scaffold here. Again, there are two loops, but notice the difference here. The first one's a for loop, the second one is a while loop. And I've given you a little bit of code to get you started. So, and I've told you what swapping code here is, and if the number is bigger, what do we do? Again, have a go at this. Really, pause the video if you're not watching it live, and uh, have a go and see what you can do.
Right, let's have a look at some of the code here. So again, you've got the procedure, insertion sort, you've got a for loop which is similar to what we had in the bubble sort, but the big difference is down here, the while position. While is such an important loop because it might not need to do anything, in which case it's gonna go through things very quickly, but if it needs to do the swaps, it will go through and put everything and insert it into the right position. Then you have your list down here, the call for the procedure and the print statement. Take a few moments to have a look through this, pause it as you need and see how it compares to your code. Right, now let's look at the comparing of the sorts. So, your bubble sort versus your insertion sort. You can see here the code is a bit longer and as I've said before, it's really important to notice that code length is no indicator of efficiency whatsoever. So, got both of them have got a for loop, but as I say, the big difference is this while loop, which is a little bit longer, but is actually saving a lot of computational time. Now, this is where sort comparisons get a bit mean, because most of the time they quote the worst, and on paper, the bubble sort and the insertion sort are as bad as each other. But look at this best case scenario. In this best case scenario, the insertion sorts will beat bubble sorts by a long way. And that's why insertion sorts are more efficient. Note in the 9618 paper, you're gonna learn a little bit more about computational efficiency. So it's worth knowing this if you're going forward with that particular paper. Right, let's have a quick look at the bubble sort versus insertion sort. Look here, something that was nearly sorted, it was really quick and efficient. Whereas now, they're roughly the same on some of the others. Right, so I've written a little program to show you what insertion sorts and bubble sorts are like in real life. So I'm just gonna uh, start that program now. So I, I don't know how many of you know Python really well, but this is uh, using a very simple module called Tekinta and it allows me to make lovely little GUIs. Um, and it's perfect for this because it allows me to just show you in real life what it's like. So what I'm going to do is create some random numbers and we're going to use some of the code that we're using in the lesson for this for the most part. I've added a few bits and pieces for timing and so on, but that's fine. So you can see there's some random numbers there. And let's first start with the bubble sort. Okay, and you can see the bubble sort has done a good job. And with these small numbers, it really probably won't make any difference to you. When we look at it, it took the computer 280 microseconds to pull this off, which isn't very long, but like all teaching, we're teaching with small numbers, things that you can use and really get a handle on before we use bigger databases. I know that in some cases I've used things that would take hours if you use the wrong kind of sort. So that's 280 seconds with a bubble sort. Let's try it with an insertion sort. 121 microseconds. And so you can see it's taken about half the time on my laptop. Now this is not a particularly scientific test, this is, but generally speaking, in Python, on my laptop, it takes about half the time. Let's ramp that right up to something a little bit more. So this is 24 numbers. Okay, let's generate those numbers for us. You can see that's a lot more. Again, let's do it with a bubble sort. And you can see the number of swaps that are going on here. It's crazy. Um, yeah, 7,203 microseconds. That's a long time for a computer to be doing a simple sort of 24 numbers. Let's do it with the insertion sort. Again, you can see the difference, 2,907 microseconds. Let's finish off today's lesson with a look at an exam pa past paper. Now this, I have to say, is not the most difficult paper by any means, but it's a great way to finish off today's lesson. The most difficult basically just ask you for the code. So, the array item list 1 to 20 stores data. A bubble sort sorts this data. What I'd like you to do is have a go at filling out the gaps.
Okay, you had a go at that? Right, excellent. So what you can see here is the answers. Just be careful of this. This is not any special code. It just means 1 or 19 because the loop can go around either way. Take a good look at that and then we'll move on to the next part of the question. So the algorithm in part A is inefficient. Explain why the algorithm in part A is inefficient. Please note the key word here is explain. We're not after code, we're after an explanation. Okay, so the answer is the algorithm continues doing comparisons even after the array is sorted. And so we get one mark per bullet, but notice you don't need to use two sentences. One sentence is enough to do this. Explain how you would prove the efficiency of this algorithm. Look back to the further in the beginning of the lesson.
So I would use a flag to indicate if any swaps have taken place in an iteration of the inner loop. If there are no changes at the end of the, an iteration, then I break the loop. And there's the mark scheme. So you can see exactly how that will get you all the marks. And the final part of this is an insertion sort is another sorting algorithm that states two situations when an insertion sort is more efficient than a bubble sort. I've already very clearly given you one. The other one I'm hoping you can kind of work out. Okay, let's have a look at that. So, an insertion sort is another sort of algorithm. State two situations. The first one I've told you is when a list is almost sorted. The insertion sort will stop as soon as the list is sorted. You can use any words you like, but that's the key thing. Situation two, when there are a large number of data items, the insertion sort will perform fewer comparisons. When you saw that practical, hopefully you saw that that's clearly true. And here is the mark scheme, just so you can have a look, good look through that. Thank you very much for today's lesson on bubble sorts and insertion sorts. Key thing to remember about an insertion sort is it is much more efficient when a list is nearly sorted. So, thank you very much, James, for uh, joining us today. It was uh, such an efficacy holding lecture, and I hope that our learners would definitely be benefiting from this lecture. So thank you very much once again, and we greatly hope that you will 
come again on the show and our learners will be benefited once again. So here comes an end to the 13th podcast of the CS uh, show and uh, get connected with me at zaconweb.com and let me show you all the connections with this podcast and check if there are any questions. Uh, you can see here underneath this video in the description all the codes that were shown alongside the visual basic codes can also be oops Here we have uh, shared James uh, GitHub and at this link you can have all the codes that James has discussed and visual basic codes as well so you can benefit from these codes for your practice. Afterwards, here are the connections over which you can reach James on Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube. And here are the resources belonging to me. There is the website, GitHub, almost all of the codes in AS, A2, and O level syllabus are there. And then we have got one uh, phone app if you like to have an app for the CS so that you can benefit from all the resources. And the resources that we have are all the notes topical past papers, discussion, online discussion groups. If you have any question, you can always ask there, uh, all the videos and everything. Beside that, we have got um, a blog as well, if you like to visit it. And I can be reached at uh, zach at zachonweb.com or you can 